Dr. Phys, Theoretical Physics, Gravity, Time, and Lagrangians. Now, this title is inspired by a paper by Elisha Huggins in The Physics Teacher. And this author is a former student of Richard Feynman, and he's a professor emeritus at Dartmouth College. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Huggins. He gave us talk, a guest talk, at a physics teacher's conference many years ago. And at that time, he told me a neat story about Feynman when he, uh, he or Elisha would do his calculations and show them to Richard Feynman, his advisor for his thesis. Richard Feynman would have ways of notation so that the notational ways of Feynman would make the calculation look so much shorter. So that's really cool. Uh, notational elegance, Richard Feynman. Well, in 1960, or around about 1960, a paper was published in 1960, Pound and Reckman did a neat experiment where they shined light down the shaft and the light gained energy and became more energetic in terms of higher frequency. It can't go faster now because speed of light goes to the speed of light. And we want to look at this and relate this to time and eventually to the Lagrangian. Well, remember our definition of work is force times distance. So if you have a constant gravitational field, you have a constant force, mg, and when you do the integral, you get mgz, or mgh. Uh, many, in many introductory physics classes, we're going to use z because h is going to be the Planck constant for us. Then if we let f equals ma, this is our trick that we did earlier in our course, then with f equals ma, you have dv dt, a little chain rule magic here, dv dz dz dt, to simply replace the dv dt. And since dz dt is your velocity, we'll put that there, and then have dv dz, and a little chain rule magic again, we get the integration with v and get v squared over 2, the 1 half mv squared. And this is the energy at the end of the fall. This is your potential energy before the stone drops, and this is mgz defined as potential energy with z equals zero gives a zero potential energy that's your reference at the earth's surface and then you have your nice conservation of energy rule when you do not have friction to worry about and that's the total energy is equal to the kinetic energy plus potential energy and that's a constant for the fall as a stone falls you have this equal to the same thing at the different location with the different values. And here, if you start off with a stone at rest at height z, so z1 is equal to z and v1 is equal to zero, you then have zero plus mgz equals, and at the end, say right before we hit the ground, we have z2 equals zero, and then v2 equals v, we have all of the potential energy here becomes kinetic energy and we have the result that we had earlier. When we apply this to light, as we said, light does not speed up, so we replace the kinetic energy formula with the energy for a photon. Energy for a photon, the Planck constant times the frequency. So our quotes falling quotes photon or photon that's moving down will have an energy change. So here you have the energy at the top this is analogous to your 1 half m v1 squared. You have the energy at the top plus the potential energy at the top is equal to the energy of the photon at the bottom plus the potential energy at the bottom. So we simply put hf in for the energy. Then we use equals mc squared to get rid of that mass and you have here the mass at the top. So we will use the energy at the top divided by c squared. Here we don't have to worry about mass because there is no potential energy. So when we do that, we have this neat little formula, hf top plus hf top over c squared times the gz is equal to hf bottom. And we solve for hf bottom and factor out here the hf top. So you have one plus gz over c squared. And if you divide by the h, you simply have this formula for the frequency. Now we're going to use an atomic laser clock to keep track of the time and we're going to see here that the time at the bottom at the top are going to be different because the frequency of our ticking clock say are not the same. F bottom does not equal F top. So let's look at the period 
how much time between ticks, see? Uh, the period is 1 over f, that's the reciprocal here. And since gz over c squared is very, very small, c, big number, squared, super big number, the g is your 9.8 meters per second squared, and z of the order of meters. So we then have this nice relationship. Uh, we flip them, t bottom equals t top, or we flip this, and because this is small, we're gonna use our Taylor series expansion. Uh, Taylor series expansion is for the one plus small number, that quantity to the nth power is one plus n epsilon. So here the n is minus one, and the epsilon is all this stuff in here. So you have all that stuff in there with the minus sign. Uh, that's a neat little formula here to remember. Whenever you have one over one plus a small thing, it's equal to one minus that small thing. And you can swap these two. So if that's negative down there, it's plus up there and vice versa. So if I want to simply bring this to the other side of the equation here, I simply put a plus sign. That's a cool little formula. So the top clock is equal to the bottom clock times C with this factor. And that means when we're ticking away, if the bottom clock is ticking away, say every second, then when this ticks, look, I get my second plus an extra. So the extra that I get here is a gain in seconds, all right, the gain per second, say the gain per second by a clock at height z is gz over c squared. Now this is a general relativistic rule because with general relativity we deal with acceleration and gravity and with special relativity we have no acceleration so I'm going to label this capital GR for general relativity. So the general relativistic rule here the gain per second by a clock at height h uh, z, excuse me, z, is equal to the delta, the time, general relativistic correction, is g z over c squared to get that clock extra time of that higher clock, that gain. Then if we go to special relativity, because uh, we're going to be moving around things also, you know the global positioning satellite system needs to employ both general relativity clock times that are different on the Earth versus in space, and also speed, the relativistic, the special relativity effect. So this is a wonderful application of both general and special relativity, and when I was a graduate student, I had never thought that there would be applications for general relativity, and here we have them with the GPS system. So if we go to special relativity for a second, this is our proper time, t naught, divided by this, get your time dilation, we derived that earlier in our course. And remember, proper time is the clock or the watch time of the watch that's in your pocket or that's on your wrist. So here, if we want to uh, write the uh, proper time that's in your pocket, the, the, the time that you are experiencing, and remember here we put that, that clock in a moving frame, and here's laboratory, T is laboratory. So we're going to write here the T sub naught, that's the clock, the proper time of the clock that's zipping by is equal to the laboratory time times this. So writing it that way, uh, my zipping by t naught, that clock that's zipping by is the top clock and the laboratory frame is the bottom clock. So doing that and playing the same uh, game with the deltas, the, tel the delta d t on the bottom, that it was ticking away, say one second here, we have a loss. So we go to the special relativistic rule, the special relativity, the loss per second by a clock moving at speed v is given by minus v squared over 2c squared. And now it's time for a Feynman's game. Two clocks on the table in a room. You take one, I take the other. We each travel with our clocks doing whatever we want, but we must bring our clocks back in one hour, when the one hour is up, according to the room clock, keeping time, and the winner is the one whose clock has gained the most time. So I gain time if I have the clock high up and I lose time if I move. So we have some strategies here. Strategy one, you should move your clock up as high as you can. You want that Z as high as you can. That's going to be good. Uh, strategy two, it's a waste to move sideways because if you move sideways, you don't change Z and you're getting penalized. Whenever you move, you get penalized. V not being zero, you're getting penalized. So strategy three is don't speed up too much now when you're getting up to that height. Because you speed up then a lot, then your V is going to be great. So you kind of have to do a trade-off here. You don't want to move too slow because then you won't go anywhere. So you have to, that's the game. Uh, play around and see who can win. So uh, the score is given by the 
sum of the uh, the, the gain and, and the loss is going to be a loss over here and the negative sign a plus so when you add these together that's the score and you win the game if your delta t player is greater than your opponents so here we go uh, we're going to sum up here a little little uh, deltas little little changes in height and we're going to have z sub n for the different heights as the seconds tick away from one second to 3600 the one hour and the little velocities here as we go so we do that uh, applying the formula here for each of the little intervals uh, segments and by doing that i'm going to move over to an integral and here delta n where delta n is one one second because we're advancing by one second we go to the integral by using our three rules one you change the delta n to a dn two you promote n to a continuous variable so you rip off the indices and put them in there as arguments z is a function of n and here the velocity is a function of n and the velocity gets squared and then you turn the summation sign into a snake so we do that and we have this nice uh, result here and that's the delta t of the score and this needs to be maximized i'm going to multiply by minus mc squared and then think of something that needs to be minimized because the negative sign will flip the logic there max becomes min so doing that i get this nice equation which you can recognize immediately this is the kinetic energy and this is the potential energy and it's the difference interesting it's the difference so it's not the total energy that'd be the sum it's the difference the difference here kinetic minus the potential there's something magical here when that gets minimized because i put the minus sign in now i'm talking about a minimum then i win the game well this here if we replace it with the traditional uh, x variable here instead of the z then i have this integral and this integrand is called the Lagrangian and this is fascinating this fascinated Feynman ever since he was in high school when a teacher knew he was bored and gave him something to think about in terms of uh, Max Manner this kind of thinking this, this principles of, of, of least uh, at a time something like that got Feynman started and on and on and he his PhD thesis was actually on applying these principles of quantum mechanics uh, this uh, minimizing the action and ultimately use these ideas in the quantum electrodynamics QED for which he shared the Nobel Prize in 1965. So we'll come back in the next video and continue from this point on.